We'll do it live! Hi folks, and welcome to an OA Labs Patreon exclusive tutorial. So today we're going to be talking about the anti-debug features in Black Matter Ransomware. This was requested by one of our Patreons. And so what I want to do is I want to show you how to defeat these anti-debug features with X64 debug. First, I'll go through the steps that you would use just in the debugger to quickly kind of bypass these uh, features without getting too in depth into what they are. Then stick around after the debugging session and I'll open up the malware in IDA and show you guys exactly what these anti-debug features are, which will be easier to explain once we've decompiled the code. And before we get started debugging, I wanna remind you that the debugging environment that we have set up here is the Flare VM install, which we described in an earlier Patreon post. So if you wanna follow along at home, follow that post, get Flare VM set up, in a Windows 10 VM so you can follow along. And we also have the Silahide plugin installed in X64 debug and X32 debug, which we'll be using for this tutorial. So that's another post on our Patreon. Make sure you follow that and have Sila installed before you start debugging. All right, so with that, let's open our Black Matter sample in X64 debug and see if we can't figure out what's going on here. Okay, so we've loaded our sample up here in X64 debug and X64 debug has automatically set a breakpoint on the entry point to the PE file. So we can just execute here until we hit that breakpoint. So you can see now we've stopped on the entry point and this will automatically be set by X64 debug. So whenever you open a PE file that's an executable, not a DLL, it'll automatically put a breakpoint on that entry point and you can always just run to the entry point. So that makes it a little bit easier to get to the code that we wanna actually debug here. So the best way to trigger these anti-debug features is to just simply step through the code until we see some sort of issue. And that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna use the step over function, this button here. And what that does is that'll step over functions. It executes the code in the function without diving the debugger into each instruction in the function. So this is a quick way to execute these functions and try and identify where we're having issues. So let's skip over the first function. No issues so far. I haven't noticed anything in the debugger. There's no errors thrown. This is a push, so we don't expect anything weird to happen here. Let's skip over this function here. And now you can see that we have an access violation issue in this function here. So that means that we've tried to execute some code that is not possible to execute. Either there is a write protection on the code or the code doesn't exist at all. In this case, we can see the uh, little hint here is showing us that there's actually null bytes. So it looks like there's actually no code at all where we want to execute. So that tells me that something's gone wrong here. And at this point, I don't know what's gone wrong but we know that this sample executes fine in a sandbox. And of course you could go and infect a VM with this and it'll work fine. So the only thing that we've introduced here is the fact that there's a debugger. So that tells me this is some sort of anti-debugging trick. And that's our first hint here. Now I didn't show you guys running this in a sandbox, but usually that's the first thing we do is we wanna run it in a sandbox or run it without a debugger attached in a safe environment in a virtual machine and see how it behaves. So in this case, we already knew that there was an anti-debug feature here. I just wanted to trigger it. And so we've triggered it here. Now what I'm gonna show you is a quick black box approach here. So we're not gonna try and identify what the anti-debug feature is. We're simply going to use our plugins. We're gonna go silo hide. We're gonna to go to a load profile. Basic profile is fine. Don't need to restart to apply changes, okay. But we do need to restart because we already hit this exception, which has been uh, cleared actually by the Silahide message, but it was there just a minute ago. So let's reload the binary to clear that exception and we'll start stepping through the code again and see if we bypass this anti-debugging control. Restart the binary, run until the entry point, step over that function, which gave us no trouble before, step over the push, step over this function. Oh my goodness, what happened here? So the process has stopped or the debugger has detached from the process. Let's take a quick look in our process explorer here and make sure that it isn't still running in the background without the debugger attached. So let's scroll down here. Uh, I only see X64 debug running. I don't see any other processes. So sometimes the reason why I check this, and this is Process Explorer. Again, if you're using the Flare VM install, uh, you can just pull it up by typing in Process Explorer in the start menu. Uh, the reason why I check here is because there are some anti-debug tricks which might detach from the debugger and continue to run the process. It's quite dangerous because then you're not actually attached to the process while it's running. In this case, it looks like the process did exit. There wasn't a detach, 
but this behavior is different from the behavior that we observed without silahide. So that means something must have definitely changed in that function that we were just looking at. So that gives us a clue that we want to look at that function with silahide enabled and see if we can't figure out what's going on here. So let's reload our binary. We'll run to the entry point. We'll jump over this function, which didn't give us any problem. We'll jump over the push. Now, instead of jumping over this function, let's debug into it and see if we can't figure out what's going on here. So I don't want to get too deep into the assembly code here, but what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into a graph view by pressing G so we can more quickly isolate the control flow of this function. Of course, you can read it if you press G to flip back to text view. You can read it just like this. But I find if you go into the graph view, it's a little bit easier to see the branches here. And so we want to talk about those a little bit. So what we're going to do now is we're going to step through this function and hopefully identify what's giving us problems here. So let's jump through these instructions here. I don't really expect anything too interesting to happen in our setup here. Uh, what I'm looking for is when this call is taken, I want to see what's actually happening here. So let's continue through here. Uh, we're going to jump to uh, negating EAX. So we're going to invert it here. We're going to jump to this little setup here. And I want to see what that call is. So let's go here. And now that we're on the call here, we can jump to it. And we'll have to go back, press G to get out of our graph view here, jump to our EIP here. Now we've jumped to another memory segment in the program. And you'll notice something interesting here. We are uh, going to jump to this EAX address, which is being resolved with an XOR function. So we move this address into EAX, then we XOR it with this address, then we jump to the result. This is a type of light obfuscation where you want to hide the final jump address, but it is not the one that is holding us up here because of course we could follow this no problem in a debugger. And where does it jump? It jumps to set information thread, which is an API call uh, in the ntdll.dll module. So the fact that this is an API call means that this is some sort of light obfuscation for the API calls. For some reason, they want to hide the fact that they're jumping to this API call. Now we can uh, just run into this API call here and then run until return. So we know that there's a problem with set information thread. Um, so let's look that up in Google, see what MSDN has to say about that particular function. Uh, maybe see if there's any anti-debugging tricks with that. Let's go to set information thread here and see if there's any anti-debugging features related to it. Looks like there's a blog post on this. I'll link this blog post below the video. Uh, if you want more information about how this works, but we can go here and look at what set information thread does. It can be used to hide a thread from the debugger. And once the thread is hidden, the uh, debugger won't receive any more events related to the thread. And of course, we haven't spawned any new threads in our process when this function was called. So that means they must be passing the main thread to this, which means that they're hiding the main thread from the debugger, which causes this problem that we're seeing here. So now that we know what they're doing in this function, why don't we skip over it and see if there's any more anti-debugging features that we need to bypass. So let's restart our binary here. We'll run until the entry point skip over this first function here. Now we don't need to push zero because it's an argument that's being passed this function. So why don't we just change EIP to point to the next function. We'll copy address here, point to the next function after this anti-debug function. And why don't we rename this anti-debug function by pressing shift semicolon and we'll add a label anti-debug. Okay, so we've copied the address of the next function past it. Right click, copy address. Right click on EIP, modify value, paste in the address here, okay. So now our EIP is sitting at the next function past the anti-debug feature. And let's see if we can call this and execute. Executes no problem. So let's just minimize our debugging session here. We'll click run and there we go. Let's just stop this before we ransom our whole machine. But you can see we've dropped the ransom note now, so no more anti-debugging issues. So in a nutshell, that's how to bypass these anti-debugging features. You need to enable silahide to hide the debugger, and then you need to bypass the set information thread 
anti-debug feature, which is a simple function call, which you can skip over. So if I was just trying to debug this quickly, that would be enough for me and I could get on with my debugging. But stay tuned for the next part where we open this in IDA and explain what these features actually do and why sometimes it's better to statically reverse engineer things before going to the debugger. That's actually one takeaway from this tutorial. Debugger is not always faster or easier. Sometimes it's faster to get look at things statically in IDA, figure out what they do, and then you're armed with the knowledge of what you need to do in the debugger. So stay tuned for part two, where we analyze these anti-debug tricks statically in IDA. And if you have any questions, remember to reach out to us on Discord. We're always listening. Uh, let us know what you think. And if you have more suggestions for tutorials like these, let us know. See you in the second part.